Welcome to A Brand New Perspective with Mike Sherbino and Julie Stoutland. Sarah Westbrook grew up like many other little girls wanting to be a singer. Over her lifetime, she's overcome great odds, her parents' divorce, low self-esteem, and the death of her beloved dad. Now, while we all go through much in our journeys, the glue that's kept Sarah together is the love of Jesus. She's an international speaker and author, helping others manage anxiety, stress, and all the difficult emotions that come with being a human. Sarah is also known as an emotional resilience strategist. And best of all, she's following her dream of making music. As fellow music people, that's sure something Mike and Julie know a lot about. Hey, we're glad you're with us today. And as we start the road to Christmas, um, my hope is that you're going to experience a lot of hope through the program today. We've got a great day, Julie. Oh, yes. You know, Absolutely. I have used a quote at different times. Mm -hmm. My first year prof in college said this, your words invite people to live or die. Mm. And I've never forgotten Ooh. that. But many times, if we use a similar uh, comparison, our words give people hope right. or heck, you know? <laughs> and there's other words we could have used, and you've probably experienced that. Mm. Maybe something has taken you down. We're hoping, we're praying today mm. that uh, through the conversations we're going to have, and as I speak on the Advent theme of hope, that you're going to find your feelings are going to be lifted. Yeah. We have an amazing guest yeah. to help us today. Well, like we say, it's not enough to just talk about emotions. It's about using emotions as information to get to know ourselves, to live out our values, true characters, and evolve into healthy emotional beings, being accountable and resilient, not sinking into buried shame and guilt that many emotions can lead us to. Here to talk more about this is professional speaker, author, singer, and emotional resilience strategist, Sarah Westbrook. Welcome, Sarah, to the show today. Oh, it is my pleasure to be here with you. You know, and, and I'm glad you're here, Sarah, and I told you that I wouldn't go off script, but when I realized that you're a singer, maybe we should start with a song. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, well, I can quickly just grab my microphone here. Yeah, if you right. Want. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay, and uh, we'll pass. Sarah, I want, before we get into Next the time. questions today, there's a phrase that was used even as we described what you do. You're an emotional resilience strategist. Okay, you got to explain that to all of us. It, it, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when we talk about emotions, which we all are emotional beings, we all have emotions. I believe that it's not just about talking about them. It's actually learning strategies and exercises to navigate them, to move with them and through them. So when I talk about strategies, it's really looking at our ability to be resilient, to bounce back and move forward from circumstances and the emotions those circumstances trigger as a muscle. Mm. And like any muscle, we need strategies and exercises, along with consistency and effort, <laughs> to keep strengthening the muscle. So just like a bicep, we need to uh, work it out when it comes to our mental muscle. Mm. That is really good. I love that reference oh. to saying mental mu muscle. Mus it's like strengthening a muscle. It's a really good picture for someone to hang on to. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and ponder that. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's, that's good. But I know, Julie, you want to ask a question. Yeah, Sarah, it's a, it's a big discussion on emotions we're having today. You, you write about emotional awareness, management, and, and through to resilience. Take us through how some circumstances in our lives trigger emotions, uh, be they anger, sadness, and, and how you can help educators, corporations, and people of all ages strategize. Mm. No, and I, and I love that you said that when it comes to challenges. So when we think about a challenge and we think about being resilient, you'll often hear an analogy of that of, say, for example, a rubber band. Mm -hmm. You know, probably you've heard the example of, look at a rubber band is resilient. I'm, I'm pulling it. It is under strain. It is under overwhelm. But then when the strain and the overwhelm is released, it goes back into shape. Mm -hmm. It bounces back. But many of us probably look at this rubber band and say, um, but I'm not a rubber band. So how does that analogy apply to me? We aren't just under challenges. 
those challenges now trigger emotions. So unlike a rubber band, we're not just bouncing back from a challenge or a strain. We're actually now, as human beings, triggered to feel emotions, Mm. anxious, nervous, scared, overwhelmed, sometimes all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. So looking at, it's not just about the challenges in life that happen, but ultimately the emotions that are experienced after that event. Mm. And how do you process and move through and with those emotions, as opposed to suppressing them, or just purely reacting out of them? There's a, mm, a, you know, a question point. I have yeah. as you say that is that let's say, and possibly it is true, that you're far more resilient than me. And so I look to you, and but in doing that, I have a sense of guilt because I'm not measuring up. And I know with the mm. whole struggle with mental health, uh, many times people just feel totally overwhelmed. So how does that resilience mm-hmm. connect to them? How do you take people from that spot and bring them up to a higher place? Yes. No, and I think our brain loves to judge and compare. And Mm. often we can use that comparison brain we have and actually put ourselves down, sometimes without even realizing it rather, saying, oh, well, you, you must have it better off than I do. Or especially when I work a lot with young people, they admit that they'll look at somebody's life, especially on social media, Mm. and see it as perfect. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, you know what, everyone faces challenges, everyone has obstacles in their life, we might not always see it on the outside. But what if knowing that no one's life is perfect, that we are perfectly imperfect, and that's what's perfect about us. Mm -hmm. And embracing the fact that although we're not trying to obtain perfection, but we can practice reflection and redirection. Mm. That's when the strategies come in so that you're not thinking, well, I'm not resilient and you are, and I'm not confident and you are. And we're saying, I might not be as resilient yet. Mm. And I think the power of that yet triggers your mind to say, oh, there's hope. Right. Oh, I can put in the effort. Oh, if I have a strategy, I can work out that muscle, that mental muscle. So just because I'm here does not mean I stay here forever. It's just I'm still learning. I'm on a journey. And isn't that what life's about? Journey, not a destination. So Mm. whenever I'm about to feel down on myself or judge and compare, I say, I just don't know it yet. Mm. Or I'm just not as strong at it yet. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that was helpful. Yeah. So let's take a moment and say, how did Jesus show emotion but stay true to his character and values? Well, if we think about all the times that there was circumstances where there was a feeling of betrayal or a feeling of emotion, because he was having a human experience. And us human beings, like time so eloquently puts, we have emotions. And uh, so, but if we look at where his choices were made from, was value-based, character of compassion, love, the character of acceptance, those character traits guided his choices. Mm. There was times where he definitely would have felt betrayed and upset and frustrated and sad. But the story would have been very different if he allowed his emotions to make his choices. But instead, he allowed his values, his character to guide his choice. And I think that that is a really great lesson for all of us looking at we do feel emotions, but emotions are not the place from which to make all choices from. Mm. That we can feel angry, but we can learn ways to move with and through anger in a healthy way so that we can still make compassionate, respectful choices for ourselves, for our dreams and for those around us. And that's really, I believe, a skill that is worth practicing. Mm. I think you make a very big point there, a very good point about the fact that we work with the emotions because you do have some people I find that are like, well, emotions are just bad. We should just get rid of them. Like, no, they're not. They're really, really good. And we need to work with it. I think that's a perfect nugget for people to hang on to. Yeah. And I've got a ton of questions based on that. And we're going to come right back after this break as we continue to talk with Sarah as regarding what does it mean to be resilient and how do we discover Maybe the magic key 
to unlock that door in all of our lives. I'm here today with Sarah Westbrook. And Sarah, as you're talking about resilience, and we all want to be resilient, yeah. uh, there's a phrase that I love and I don't love. And it's, it seems like an excuse, but it's also a reality because we're broken people. And it's a phrase, it's okay not to be okay. And so, okay, I just accept that, but I'm dealing with sadness, anger, confusion. Am I going to stay stuck there forever because it's okay to not be okay? Or am I going to bury my emotions, all right, in shame? So help me get out of the dark place. Because even in my role as a pastor, uh, I talk to many people who've stayed in the dark cellar for years. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. it's time to get out of there. Yeah. How do we get out without making people feel guilty? Okay, I love this. Okay, I'm going to take this moment to do a little chalkboard work on you. I'm going old school Go for professor it. for a moment here. <laughs> So this is, this is, I'm springboarding off. You said, it's okay not to be okay. And this is one of the other sayings you may have heard. It's okay to feel. Oh, to feel. <laughs> Actually, okay. yeah. It's okay to feel. So it's okay to feel. It's mm -hmm. okay to feel. We've seen this a lot, especially of late. Hashtag mental health matters, breaking mm -hmm. down mental health stigmas. It's been really brought to the forefront, especially in the last two plus years. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to feel. It's okay not to feel okay. These are not enough. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. They actually have to be a practice. So when we go back to that mental well-being, that mental strength, that resilience is a muscle, mm -hmm. this has to be a practice. Ever caught yourself doing this? Don't be anxious. You shouldn't <laughs> be so anxious. Don't be angry. Sarah, come on, stop being angry. Don't be sad. Stop it. Ever caught yourself telling your own self what not to feel? Mm -hmm. On a few times, yeah, a few occasions. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when I do presentation, it doesn't matter if I'm working with students, educators, parents, corporate, they're all like, yes, I've been there. And I said, okay, so in that moment, are you practicing telling yourself it's okay to feel? If we know that there's emotions and emotions even have science behind them, they can actually be used as information, mm. even focused into motivation. If you're telling yourself not to feel what you're feeling, do you find it helpful? Mm. So, so you your, have to your know. emotions are real. Your emotions yeah. are real. All right. But what if it's not based on reality? Then whose right. responsibility like it is it to change that? It could be on perspective, right? Mm. How you're seeing the circumstance can happen and now you're creating a story or an inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. And that also triggers an emotional state. You hit the nail on the head. Mm. So what I ask my audiences and who I get to work with is if you tell yourself not to feel what you're feeling, do you find that that is helpful? That when you tell yourself, don't be anxious, it just goes away. And people are like, no. I said, well, what happens? 99% of people say it heightens their emotional state. They start to feel shame, bad mm -hmm. and wrong. Now they're spiraling. So why, why is that not being practiced? It's okay to feel. Oh, I know. Because emotions aren't this. Comfort. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, we like comfortable stuff as human beings. You like comfortable pillows, yes? Mattresses? <laughs> yeah. That looks like my pillow. Yeah, I, think, I think you got my pillow right there. Mm -hmm. um, and emotions aren't always this, right? Like right. disappointment, anxious. And so maybe we practice without even knowing it, telling ourselves not to feel mm. emotions because we think they're not comfortable and hopefully they just go away and then we feel comfortable. But I think we get ourselves into a spiral where actually telling ourselves not to feel just adds more disconnect, shame, and guilt, heightening our emotional state, making mm. us feel really down. And so I think that this strategy of telling ourselves what not to feel is actually 
hindering a lot of people's ability to bounce back. Permission to feel what you're feeling, but you don't have to live there. So the skill becomes, and this goes off what you're saying, and I love that you said this, this still becomes in emotions are part of the journey, but they're Mm. not to be stuck and lived in. We've got to find healthy ways to, yes, be aware of it, name your emotion, but find ways to manage it Mm. in a healthy way. And, and talking to people, you know, resilience is very much about support, but some people allow their emotions to stop them from even talking about what they're really going through because they're embarrassed. Right. Okay. So quick right. question. That'd be courageous. You mm. talk about, we need to talk to people. Is that different than being accountable? Oh no. So this is okay. So I, I get where you're going and I agree with you. Emotions are a reason for a behavior. They are not an excuse for one. Okay. That's, that's a no. really good point. No, no, it is not okay to harm yourself or someone around you and say, ah, I felt like it. Mm. I don't know. I was mad or sad. No, no, no. Although we are born to feel a wide range of emotions, mm-hmm. it is essential that we are accountable we learn how to, and this is something, you know, uh, us as babies, I'll just remind Aww. us. <laughs> there we go. These babies aren't born just knowing how to navigate emotions and self regulating, and, you know, they're not. So it's very much a taught and learned skill. Mm. But be, it is an essential skill so that you can say, okay, I'm feeling this way. I'm allowed to feel upset and angry and frustrated and sad and happy and content and all those emotions. But the strategy is what do I do with those emotions in a healthy way Mm -hmm. so I can still show up as kind, respectful, and brave, even though sometimes I feel sad, angry, and anxious. So So while it's okay to feel, not okay to use as an excuse. (laughs) So I feel like you've kind of asked this, but someone who you're saying then who's highly emotional, who won't necessarily have the wherewithal to put strategies in place because they're emotional, (laughs) how do they get around this chicken and egg problem? (laughs) My number one, this is my number one exercise, even for myself, is doing check-ins like doing emotional check-ins before we get ourselves to a heightened state. Because you know when someone just says, oh, I'm overwhelmed. I'm sure there was many other emotions that led up to that moment. Uh, You know, even when I look at myself as a parent, where I will all of a sudden, there'll be something that happens. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back. (laughs) But if I would have done check-ins with myself, I would have noticed, okay, Sarah, I'm feeling really frustrated right now by something my son's doing or saying, okay, now I'm feeling really agitated. Oh, now I'm starting to feel angry. And having that emotional awareness, being able to name your emotions Mm. and check in actually is a skill that a lot of us don't often practice. Mm. We're more reactive than being proactive and saying, okay, there is great benefit in me noticing my emotions, noticing where it's physically impacting me. Is my heart racing? I'm sure all of us have had a headache from emotions or a Mm -hmm. tight jaw or neck, butterflies. And doing those check-ins and then saying, okay, I'm allowed to feel this way. It's part of the journey. It's part of the human experience. We're not robots. But now what I do with my emotion matters. So is it deep breathing? Is it going for a walk? Is it talking to someone? Is it screaming into that lovely pillow? (laughs) Is it, is it, is it prayer? Is it, what is it? And I even like making a list of things that work for me because sometimes your brain forgets when you're in the heat of an emotional state. I even do that with, with people I work with in my son, make a list, have some Mm. strategies in your toolbox. Wow. You have so much meat there. I just, uh, we are out of time and I'm like, I had more questions, but such wonderful stuff that you've shared with us. Uh, So many nuggets that our viewers are going to be able to hang on to. Sarah, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, I think we're going to have to have you back. Oh, we're looking for, I'm already planning it right now uh, for our next recording. So I hope you'll come back and maybe you can come into the studio. And uh, that would be be a sweet opportunity. That sounds great. Thank Thank you, Sarah, for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone, stay with us. We'll be right back. I want to take this moment to tell you why we do the perspective. And Julie, there are two words going through my mind. (laughs) I know what they are. What are they? Hope and help. 
you got it. You knocked it out of the park. <laughs> Hope and help are so important. And can I just share with you as the viewing audience that we want people to experience the hope that happens when they put their trust in Jesus. I know it transformed my life. It will transform yours if it hasn't already. We also wanna help people and through the many interviews and as we teach God's word, to help people to realize that the Lord is with us, that he is our refuge and strength. So could I ask you to help me give hope to people across our country? Why not go to the link below and donate to support the perspective and together we can give hope and help to our country. One of the things that really stood out to me is, is the fact that we are highly intellectual beings. We need to Thank remind ourselves. We need to remind not just ourselves, but everybody. And if we are, then emotions shouldn't have complete control of us. We should be able to say, Let's take a moment here. I'm feeling this. Let's analyze this. You know, you take a grab a breath before we let them escalate to uh, overcome it. So I think that was really interesting and, and uh, appropriate how she broke it down like that. So yeah, if you are a highly emotional person, I think you're intelligent enough to know you're a highly emotional person. I'm a highly emotional person. I know I'm a highly okay, emotional hold on. person. Let me, let me just cut in for a minute, okay? <laughs> And, and hear me when I say this, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I wish Sarah was on right now because here's the deal. We as guys get pegged with, we keep all our emotions in. Mm. I've heard that from my wife mm. on different occasions and saying, what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Tell me all about it. And it's almost like we need someone to unlock the door. True. Whereas oftentimes, not always, but women are more able to express mm -hmm. their emotions and get it off their chest. Maybe that's why guys seem to have more heart attacks Maybe, than others. Who Maybe knows? keep who it knows? all inside. Who knows? And so we're gonna have Sarah back. Absolutely. We, have to have Sarah we need back. to hear uh, we need to hear and be able to process what it means to live healthy lives. That's Would you right. not agree? Absolutely. Well, you know, I knew you were gonna agree with me on that <laughs> one. Uh, I wanna continue this whole teaching on hope because mm -hmm. we desperately need it. Yes, we and do. Uh, I just wanna say to you as you're watching today, God's not done with you yet. The best is yet to come. Stay with us because I'm gonna continue on the whole Advent theme of hope. So how was your hope meter today? How is it that you are truly feeling inside? You're overwhelmed with emotion, overwhelmed uh, maybe with that sense of despair that things can't improve, they can't get any better. I love the story that we've been dealing with this past week because it speaks to you and to me. The story of the prodigal son. Maybe better it would be described as the, the story of two sons. The prodigal son lives a wild life. He takes the dad's money, he spends it all, and then he bottoms out. The older brother gets just ticked off that his younger brother had the nerve audacity to come home and that his dad welcomed him back. And uh, in the midst of that, the older brother's hopes were dashed, just as the younger brother had his hopes dashed when he ran out of money. How do you bring it all together? There's something in both characters that I think we find in you and me. The older brother has the sense that injustice has happened, that his brother should have been punished more and should not have been welcomed in at least until he came crawling on his hands and knees for maybe 10 years. The older brother, the younger brother rather, is just at wit's end corner and he has nowhere else to turn except to his father. And if you're at that point today, or maybe you're filled with anger and rage like the older brother was, I'm gonna tell you that that will take away your hope as well, as much as crisis or calamity or a whole choice of bad decisions. It doesn't really matter what boat you're in, you lose hope. But the good news is this, is we have a heavenly father who calls us back to him. We have a father who calls us back. He doesn't say that everything is fine, that what you've done, you know, and it was okay to party hardy, or it's okay to have those feelings of anger and injustice. But we have a father who gave his son Jesus. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's why there is hope because Christ came, God came in the flesh and he took on the nature of a man like you and I. 
And as a result, a savior has been born and it has given the world hope. You know, the angel's declaration, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill among men. Well, the only reason we can have peace in our hearts is because of the amazing hope that God gives us. What we find in the story of the two sons is that hope is redefined. I've written down here that uh, hope is the general feeling that some desire will be fulfilled. And in spite of the young boy's troubles, he never gave up hope. Hope is wishing with expectation for a better future. The problem with Christmas, or the problem with holidays, is that it oftentimes can highlight unmet expectations, things that have disappointed us, things that have crushed our hopes because we're forced to deal with maybe it's the cranky uncle or aunt that's at the table, or maybe we're living in isolation and we wish that we were in a happy family. Maybe you've been in an abusive situation and all of a sudden it is highlighted. And especially when it comes to the presence, hope is often taken away when we compare ourselves. Maybe we need to shut off our Facebook app for the holidays because I see people talking about what they're getting or where they're going or the trip. And we say, oh, I only hope that I could have that. But I want us to close today by considering some scriptures that will give us hope, that will carry us above circumstantial stuff. Because whatever it is your friend gets that's better than yours, I'm going to tell you that by next year, it's going to be old and worn out. We're going to need more. And more plus more plus more does not equal more. The young son realized that what he needed more than anything else was to be back with his heavenly father. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 19, the certainty of God's promises are like the hope that we take hold of. We have this hope and it's like an anchor. Picture the boat anchor, an anchor of the soul, both firm and steadfast. The promises of God are what gives us hope that if we come to him, he'll never cast us out, that we can cast our care on him because he cares for us. And even though friends might leave us or desert us, or we do a bonehead thing like the young man did when he took his dad's money and he spent it lavishly, the promise is that if we come back to our father, he's there to welcome us. You know, the Bible says that faith is being sure of what we hope for, and hope and faith are linked together at the hip. Don't journey into this Christmas season without the hope that Christ wants to give you. And it happens when we trust in Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. Could I invite you to pray a prayer of hope with me right now? To say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you as my Savior and Lord and friend. Fill me with your hope today. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer, write to me at the perspective. I have some literature to send to you that will fill you with hope.